Hey, welcome to Unleashed. I'm your host, Will Bachman. Unleashed is produced by Umbrex, the first global community connecting top-tier independent management consultants with one another. We just heard from today's guest, Annie Scranton, the founder of Pace Public Relations, a full-service media relations and communications agency based in New York City. If you want to raise your visibility by getting interviewed on TV or by print journalists, this is the episode for you since Annie explains the basics of how public relations work. You can find out more about Pace Public Relations on their website, pacepublicrelations.com. And if you want to connect with Annie, Annie's LinkedIn URL is in the show notes. And you can also follow Annie on Twitter at, at Annie Scranton. Finally, I'd like to welcome new listeners Aliak K, James M, Aiden K, Burns H, and Hussein A, who have recently signed up for the weekly Unleashed email. If you too would like to receive the transcript of each episode, plus other bonus features right in your inbox, email me at unleashed at umbrex.com. Hello, Annie. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So, Annie, let's start with what are two or three misconceptions people have about public relations? I think the biggest misconception is that it's easy to work with a PR firm and to immediately get traction and placement for your company or your brand. Um, it sort of has a connotation of being one of those professions that's maybe a little fluffy or that maybe isn't quite as serious as, say, you know, being a medical doctor. And of course, it's not, but um, we're not saving lives over here. But I do think that a lot of times, clients seem to say, well, why can't we get featured in the New York Times? Why why wasn't that reporter interested? And I think there's a, there's a lack of knowledge of just sort of how the journalistic process works and how media entities work in general. Okay. Well, let's dive into that one a bit. So, so educate us, how does public relations work? So at a very rudimentary level, a client hires a PR firm and a client could be a large company, a startup, an individual person, a product brand, um, any of those things, and anybody or any product or any company can benefit from public relations. So when that client decides to hire a publicist, They are paying the PR firm a monthly retainer that is going to compensate the publicist for her or his time doing outreach to the media on behalf of that client. So we are essentially the liaison um, between the client and the media. And the reason why it's beneficial to hire a PR firm is one, I was a former journalist, speaking as a former journalist and TV producer, you know, when you're pitching yourself to the media, you're automatically not taken quite as seriously than you are when you have a professional organization doing it for you. That's why PR exists as a profession. And number two, presumably the publicist or PR firm that you hire has really strong connections with the journalists. And that means everything. Um, Journalists and producers are really, really busy. When I was producing TV um, um, almost 10 years ago, I would get literally hundreds of email pitches every day. And so I would automatically delete them if I didn't know the person who was actually sending me the note. So the competition is, is really fierce. But to go back to your original question, Hiring a PR firm means that you are getting their expertise and knowledge of how the process of working with journalists works, what makes a good story. That publicist will help you craft your message and tell your story in the most compelling way that will hopefully get the interest of a journalist. 
And then we work with the journalist, the, the print reporter, the TV producers on an ongoing daily basis to make sure that our clients are represented in the media in the best way possible. Okay, great. So uh, let's kind of walk through the stages of an engagement and let, let's position as your kind of potential or hypothetical client here would be either uh, an independent consultant um, or potentially a, a small boutique firm with a, with a handful of professionals and they're trying to raise their profile. It's obviously great to get featured in some kind of, you know, um, you know, news, newspaper or magazine or, or interviewed on TV or, or wherever, um, both as credit credibility, you know, at credibility building, you know, as mentioned in the New York times as quoted in, you know, Reuters or something as well as it's great probably for search engine optimization. If, if those, uh, uh, articles have a link back to your, to your website. So we, we understand the purpose. So, uh, maybe as the first step, let's say you, you meet with someone, uh, they decide to engage you. Is there, before you go off and start pitching them, is there a process of diagnostic of hearing their story and helping figure out like what's the hook or, you know, what are you, what specific thing are you going to go pitch and also figuring out what's the target set of journalists that you're going to go pitch? How does that initial phase one look? Of course, there's definitely an onboarding process that we at, at my company have sort of fine-tuned at this point after doing this for nearly 10 years. So the first thing we do that I think smart publicists do is we send our clients a new client questionnaire to answer even before our engagement officially begins. And it goes over some really important criteria. The number one important criteria is what are your goals? And when I say goals, I mean, what are the goals for your business in general, meaning what do you want the business to achieve this month, this year, and five years from now? And then what are your goals with the media and how can we, you know, help use the media to leverage your overall company goals? And I think without knowing what the goals are, it's very hard to be successful, right? At anything that you do. So that's number one. And, and as you mentioned, when you were setting up the question, a lot of clients, come to us specifically only wanting to get quoted so they can get the backlinks, the hyperlinks for SEO purposes. Some clients come to us because they really want to try to use PR to leverage new clients or new customers. Some clients come to us because they want to have the overall brand awareness and legitimacy and credibility. So depending on what avenue they want to pursue, we are going to recommend different media outlets to try and achieve those goals. But generally speaking, after our clients fill out the new client questionnaire, we will do a one to two hour kickoff meeting where we go over what we've learned in that questionnaire, but we also then start to loosely talk about what is a 90 day like strategy plan look like. And within that plan, we are discussing what are the angles and the messaging that you want to get seen in, you know, in the media. A question we often ask our clients is, if you could wake up tomorrow and there was a front page article in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or whatever publication is perfect for your organization, what would you want that headline to say? What do you, how do you want to be perceived in the media? And then we try to really always use that as an anchor for all of the pitching that we're doing. And then we also, of course, go over what are the media outlets that you want to target? Are trade publications important? Is business press important? Is local press important? Or is national press sort of where you want to be focused? Um, and then from there, we'll do a recap of that meeting, put together the strategy, and then actually start writing the pitches and pitching the media. And that process, usually we do it pretty quickly. It takes between one to two weeks. What I mean, the naive person like me might assume that uh, the the bigger and and more well known the the um, the outlet the better right like the New York Times would be the best or the Wall Street Journal would be the best or you know Financial Times or something would be the best is that always true or is it sometimes actually more effective to be featured in some more niche trade publication or something or even like a blog or something so 
It, so the answer is is that every case is different, but the but the way I could try to answer it is that I think both or all forms of media play a role um, in in serving the goals of the, of our clients. So if anybody, any brand gets a feature that's positive or a mention that's positive in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, NPR, et cetera, it's going to help them because they're just by the sheer volume of readers or listeners that those outlets have, you're going to see a boost. You're going to get a ton of emails coming into you. Your brand awareness is going to go up, et cetera. So yes, always we want, we want to keep those sort of on our target list. However, when you have a very specific goal in mind, like if you are trying to target a very specific type of customer or client, sometimes going to those trade publications is the way to go. And I can give you a quick example, something I did in my own marketing efforts. We work with a lot of attorneys and there is a legal website called law360.com that primarily only lawyers read. And and I wrote an article that for Law 360 that was titled The Nine Tips for Becoming a Legal Pundit on Television. And I gave my my top advice. Law 360 published it. As a result, I got about 10 inbound calls from lawyers saying, I read your article. I'm so intrigued. I want to learn more about your company and PR and how it works. And so that same sort of tactic can be applied for any of our clients and whatever publications their target customers are reading. That's interesting because it, it, it might almost be that it feels more approachable if you see an article by a someone in, in a trade journal like that with their maybe their contact info at the bottom, you say, okay, I can contact that person. But if you see someone quoted in the New York Times, even if they seem like an expert, if you had been quoted in the New York Times on that topic, it might have been less effective because it's like, how am I going to contact that person? It just it doesn't seem as, as sort of, I don't know, neighborly or close. I, I well yeah I I think so I think appearing in a trade publication is is not you're not, you're not like oh my god this person's like you know this major CEO or celebrity I mean maybe you are but you are approaching the reader yes in a more um, friendly peer to peer way almost where in a a big tier one publication automatically by virtue of that your your stature is being elevated um, which is great again because maybe huge corporations or whatever, or maybe it's going to lead to some other sort of partnership that you may not even be thinking about, but for your target customer, it, it, you're right. There may be that sort of like disconnect of, Oh, I don't know if I can, if I should even reach out to this person. Yeah. Okay. So how does the actual outreach work? So, um, people, I mean, I probably have some misconceptions about it. Is it, you know, you're reaching out to kind of friends who are journalists who you just have lunch with and they or or is it that you cultivate your relationships over time and you're probably having to kind of add value and make their life easier somehow and they you know so how do those relationships kind of grow over time and what's the process of reaching out to to journalists do you reach out to like two or three or do you sort of reach out to 200 how does that whole process work of outreach and pitching stories i mean well we always do email pitches because I think increasingly everybody likes talking on the phone less and less these days. So I only pick up the phone to call a journalist if it's something incredibly urgent that I think is absolutely perfect for her or him. And otherwise, it's always on email. You know, my relationships with with journalists and producers um, has been organic because I was one. I was a former TV news producer and print journalist. So I maintain friendships with many of those producers and journalists. And then over over the years, they've introduced me to other friends of theirs and other contacts of theirs. And so now I'm specifically, I'm in a position where it's a mixed bag of friends of mine who are still members of the media, introductions that they've made um, to other members of the media, and then also just me reaching out cold to journalists that I would like to become, you know, uh, uh, have d- develop a working relationship with. Um, and so that 
is one huge advantage of working with a PR firm is that presumably that PR firm already has built in working relationships with the members of the media. Furthermore, because of my background, I very much understand how the news cycle works, what their deadlines are, what types of stories they're looking for, what types of experts they want to quote. So that that's the job of a publicist is to know how, the difference between each publication and understand all of those nuances amongst them. So, I mean, it's, it's something that, you know, anybody can theoretically pretty much easily find the email address of a, of a reporter they're looking for. But, you know, what's important to remember here is that really the journalists aren't there to serve you. You are there to serve the journalists. They are able to write what they want to write about. I mean, they obviously have an editor and, and you know, there may be certain specific things they need to cover on certain days. But, it's not like they're owing anybody any favor. So our job is to is to really spend a lot of time like researching that reporter and seeing what were the past 10 stories he or she has written. What's their beat? What interests them? We follow a ton of journalists on social media to also get a sense of like where their interests lie and the types of things that they're following and that what they're interested in. And then from there, it, it depends on the tactic we use. Sometimes we reach out directly with a specific pitch where we are saying, hello, reporter, we work with this client and this is the angle we think is perfect for you and we hope you'll write about it obviously in a better way than what I just said. But then there are other times where we just say, we are working with this client and we think that, you know, they could potentially become a good resource for you. Would you be open to, you know, a phone conversation or a meeting? Sometimes I just try to meet different reporters and producers for a coffee just to get to know them without a specific ask. So we kind of just do a variety of tactics to, you know, get in, quote unquote, with different journalists. When you're pitching a, a journalist, I can imagine kind of three different approaches, and I'm curious what is sort of most commonly done. Let's say that you're representing someone who is, uh, let's say, like an international kind of trade supply chain expert, right? You're trying to raise that person's profile. And so w w one approach would be to you know, tell the you know, pitch the journalist like, hey, you could do like a feature story on this, you know, trade expert person. But another one would be make it more tied to the, like almost kind of try to serve them up a story and say, hey, I think a really interesting story would be how the tariffs on China are affecting the electronics, you know, manufacturing industry in, you know, I don't know, Ohio. And uh, here's some interesting facts about it. By the way, my client so and so could be an interesting source for the story. Uh, she has a lot of knowledge about how the tariffs are increasing their costs. So you're kind of serving them up a story and just saying, "Oh, by the way, you could quote this person to make it easy for them." You know, and a third way might just be like, "Hey, if you're ever doing a story on tariffs, you know, here's a, here's a source." Like, wh wh where do you typically land? Which is most effective? Somewhere in between two and three. I mean, a feature on a company, like, it's got to really be, you know, usually like more of a trade publication would be a place that would do a a feature on a client or a, a smaller sort of niche blog or website or podcast or something of that nature. But when it's any sort of mainstream media, I think the thing you want to avoid is like pitching, like, like saying to the journalist, Hey, here's a story I think you should write about because like you want to always be deferential, you know, and sort of make them feel like it's, it's their idea. But, you know, it's certainly like if you've, if you've researched a reporter and you know that they're covering the tariff trade situation and how it affects different businesses, you could write something like, I see that in your past few articles, you've explored how the trade war is affecting, you know, um, manufacturing and it's uh, affecting paper production and whatever. And, you know, um, if you, if you're ever thinking about shifting into how it's affecting electronic distribution, we have somebody who can speak to that. Then furthermore, you want to definitely include 
how it's affecting, like give a quote or two or some bullet points from your client on how it is actually affecting them. And then sort of end it by saying, you know, that even if this isn't a particular angle that they're interested in, you know, you are very happy to always connect the journalist to your client. If, if there's ever a tangential story where you think they'd be able to, you know, lend an expert quote or help in some thought leadership way. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's sort of introducing people as knowledgeable sources on a potential topic that that journalist covers to kind of help them out. 100%. Absolutely. Because if that's their beat and like the trade work term stuff is like not going away anytime soon, it doesn't seem. So they're probably looking for new and interesting people to quote. But where where you have to be flexible is that it may not be the exact story you want published, but just by virtue of getting your name and your company quoted or mentioned in that, in any piece that a big reporter is writing, it's going to help your brand and your and your image. When you read stories in the paper uh, or on the news and TV news, can you typically sense who may have pitched that story to the journalist? Sometimes it's obvious even to me. If it's like some kind of in, like report that just came out and a bunch of people are quoted, but there's one person who's quoted more and that person's like the author, you, you kind of figure, okay, you know, that person was probably the one who pitched the story. Do you have a sense of that? Do you, kind of, you can kind of tell what happened behind the scenes there? I mean, yes. I mean, particularly, I mean, obviously when you see who the guests are on cable news, their people are pitching them, you know, so you know who's, you know who's behind those bookings. On the other hand, though, a lot of times for TV news, at least the anchor or the senior or executive producers will ask for specific people or will ask for someone from a specific organization to go on and give that point of view. And you see that more commonly when it's a debate segment and maybe there's someone on the left and someone on the right. You know, there are certain people who are interested and enjoy doing quote unquote opposition media, meaning if you're right leaning, you'll do, you know, CNN or MSNBC or vice versa. So, I mean, that's sort of obvious. And when you're reading an article and there's a new poll or a survey or something, you know, of course, it's the it's the place it's the it's the organization that put that together that's pitching that that's that's how that's how it got placed in there um, for sure. But a lot of times, you know, there are just different working relationships, different things going on behind the scenes that that we don't even know about. You know, that are that are the reason why a story got published, and it could be. As simple as the journalist is friends with somebody, it could be as simple as the editor, you know, has some sort of interest in making sure they're, you know, covering whatever type of outlet. So there's a lot going on behind the scenes. But usually, yeah, at this point, I can pretty much tell. For, for those of us who would, you know, love to get mentioned in the paper or, you know, be on the news, what are some things to do that would kind of that journalists look for that would build up, you know, that you need to do to kind of build up your credibility uh, in order for them to want to talk to you or to quote you. I mean, so if we go to like our example of the, you know, the trade expert who does international supply chain consulting, if you just say, oh, this person is, you know, knows all about supply chain and maybe they were at a top tier consulting firm and now they have an independent practice and it says on LinkedIn that they, that's what they do. But they don't have any kind of white papers or you know podcast or publications or blog or anything it might be hard to convince a journalist that the person kind of knows what they're talking about as opposed to either a professor or someone who you know has an active content generation you know platform so what what does it typically take to get a journalist to say oh yes this person has clear credibility and i'm willing to you know talk to that person well, the number one thing is if you're an independent consultant or part of a, a company, there has to be a website where people can go and read about your bio. Um, if you don't have your own website, then it, like a LinkedIn is not sufficient usually for a journalist. Um, so I would say the number one thing would be to have a website. It could be super simple. Uh, you know, just with your name, your bio, your past clients, a bit about your expertise. Um, and then the other thing that I think is 
very important is to start a blog section on that website where you're writing every day if you can. It could be very, very short, but if you're writing and you are choosing to opine on day of news, very topical things that pertain to your industry, that is an automatic way that a journalist is going to see is going to see that and read those short pieces and say, wow, they're really following the news and they really have cultivated some strong opinions about how the trade war is affecting A, B, and C. And those can get certainly reposted on LinkedIn and, and whatever. And I, that's, number one piece of advice. And then number two, I think it's really important to have all of your social media be sort of aligned with one another, meaning your Twitter and your LinkedIn, whatever you have like public facing should all be under the same handle and have the same sort of feel to it. I think whatever you can do to get as many followers as you can, I think that's another way to just show that you have a basis in your community, you know, and people are, are interested in, in keeping up with you and, and what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, you know, but to, to sort of play on the other side of it, it is hard to compete with somebody who has a position at a university or has just written a book on the subject or whatever. But if you can get to the right person and sort of have your digital footprint really looking polished, I do think that there's a strong possibility that you could be quoted. Interesting. So when you talk about aligning your social media, the public facing stuff, that's Twitter. Are you also, what else are you including beyond Twitter? Are you including Facebook? Are you including Instagram? Are you including? Well, I mean, I think it depends what your, what your brand is and what, what you're like for me and PR, we have an Instagram, we have a LinkedIn, we have a Facebook, we, we have literally all of it because our clients can come from any of those areas and many of our clients are on all of those different platforms. So, but I think most likely for your listeners um, and in general, I think Twitter and LinkedIn are the two most important. Okay. Let's talk about uh, for an independent consultant or boutique firm, what could you realistically expect to get from public relations and with a kind of in the, with the typical kind of fee structure that we should expect? And let's say that we're, again, you know, using our hypothetical example of this person who's a, maybe a McKinsey alum, was an AP, associate partner in McKinsey, is now an independent consultant, does international supply chain consulting, the person has worked in China some, maybe they, they have a, a blog or a podcast that they're not doing every day, but they, you know, publishing something maybe once every week or two. What would it take for that person to, you know, if they wanted to hire public relations and get quoted in places, you know, how much would it cost roughly? You know, what, what should you expect and, and how long does it take to get impact and to start seeing you know, seeing pieces. Uh, walk, walk, walk us through that a little bit. Sure. So rates for PR firms can really drastically vary. Um, in in New York City or for any of the national, I think five thousand a month is like on the lower end, and it can it can certainly go up. But I would say for an independent practitioner or small boutique firm, probably around 5000 a month would be realistic to expect. I mean, our firm w- works really fast in terms of pitching and trying to get results. And I would say that most of our clients start to see traction within about six weeks because there is, of course, a little bit of prep time. You know, unfortunately, when you're pitching journalists, it's not like the journalist receives an email and then the next day there's an article, you know, there's a lot that goes on that goes into it. um, And that goes on behind the scenes, of course. So I would say that usually most engagements are in the very short end, three months. Most are about six Some people sign a year long contract. And, you know, what we would try to do then is say, this person is blogging twice a week, as as you said. We would try to say, well, can can we take any of these blogs and turn them into 
an op-ed somewhere or as a contributor article somewhere? Or can we take quotes from it that's pertaining to the trade war and pitch it to these 15 journalists that cover that beat specifically and see if, you know, they're going to start, they would be able to use those quotes in another piece. We would also try to set up introductions, you know, meaning coffee meetings, phone introductions to different journalists, because at some point we do remove ourselves from the process and we want our client to speak directly to the journalist because obviously they're going to be the best at explaining it. And, you know, the process too, though, is really more successful the more involved the client is. So meaning, you know, if we send you early in the morning, there's this hot trade war stuff, you know, there's new stuff with China. Like, what is your point of view on it? What do you make of this situation? If the client can get us some quick talking points within an hour, we have a better chance of turning it for a day of story that day. So, you know, that it's it's kind of like what you put into it is a little bit what you're going to get out of it. Do PR firms typically specialize in, you know, in sort of an industry or, or functional areas so that maybe they build up uh, kind of rep- relationships with journalists who cover the tech industry or or the energy industry or something? So is it is it typically kind of folk specialized like that? Uh, There are. There are certainly lots of PR firms that have um, specialties, travel, beauty, tech, you know, um, yes, all all of that kind of stuff, um, 100%. But then there are a lot of firms like myself that are generalist PR firms, meaning they could have all types of clients um, because for us, the common thread with all our clients is getting them traditional media relations placements. Um, so placements on TV, print, digital, and radio or podcast. So so the answer is yes. And there are benefits to, to both, I think, in my opinion. It just kind of finding a PR firm is, is something that is kind of really personal um, because any good and ethical publicist will tell you there's no guarantee when you work with a a PR firm that you're going to see these great articles and this great result and this great momentum. What we can guarantee is that we're going to advise you and craft your messaging and tell your story in the best way possible to get the maximum number of, you know, positive responses from journalists. But at the end of the day, I can't control what a journalist decides to write or not write or what a producer wants to put on TV or not. And, you know, you do need to be sort of willing to take that leap of faith. But if you do your research on your PR firm and you talk to past clients and you see examples of the type of stuff they've done, you know, you you should be able to have good results. How do you recommend that uh, people who, you know, th- we've done all this work to get a interview with a journalist and now let's say one's, one's lined up. How do you recommend that people prepare for these uh, discussions with journalists? Do you ha- help people rehearse, help people avoid saying like and um and kind of and all those <sighs> annoying uh, things like I probably have? Or yes. so what's the best way to prep for those, for those uh, media appearances? Okay, so if it's a TV interview, we typically, we don't require it, but we recommend strongly that our clients get media trained prior to doing a live TV interview. And there's two reasons for that. Well, there's there's a few reasons for it. The first reason is that if you're doing a TV interview and it doesn't go well, you will never be asked on that show or network again, and it will be very hard to get another interview on any other competing network after that. So the first one is super important. You need to make sure that you nail it. What you just said is part, is the second reason, certainly working on little quirks or filler words that we say a lot like um or like are are definitely something that working with a media trainer can help you to do less of. And the third reason is that doing an interview is a very fine balance between listening to the reporter's question and answering that question mixed with making sure that you are getting across the message and the branding for your company 
that you want to get out there, but it's a really terrible move when someone does an interview with a journalist and instead of really answering the journalist's question, they're just sort of pivoting back to talking about their own company and their own stuff. Reporters hate that for obvious reasons. And so that's something that a media trainer can work with you on sort of how to how to how to weave in your company's own messaging in a very organic way that's not going to seem overtly salesy. When when we're doing an interview, when we're setting our clients up with an interview with a print or digital journalist and it's not recorded, we prep them by, you know, giving them a packet ahead of time that's going to have information on the outlet on the reporter, links to several of their past articles for them to read, all of the information that we could ascertain about what types of potential questions the journalist is going to ask, and then go over with them, here are some key messaging points that you're going to want to try to get across. I must admit, I have never heard of the concept of a media trainer, at least not that I can recall. I suppose it's an obvious thing that it would exist. Tell me a little bit more about that. Is that something that your firm offers or are there folks that you refer people to? Tell me a little bit about a media trainer and how that works. Yeah, um, we have someone in New York who we refer all of our clients to um, who's been doing this for years and did it internally at national TV networks, grooming up and coming reporters. So he's really skilled at what he does. You, you want to share his name? You're welcome. Hit, you know. Sure. His name is Michael Sorrentino and he's actually my husband. And so we, we do work together in that capacity. Um, I'm always uh very upfront with my clients about that, but he gives he gives the best service possible to them. He knows I would kill him if he didn't. Um, <laughs> but what happens is he has a studio on 37th and Madison. And I should mention, his primary job is doing video production, um, so making videos for his clients. But this is something he does in, in conjunction with that. But at his studio in Midtown, he has a green screen studio, and so he is actually able to create what a, an actual in-studio live TV interview would feel like. And then he does, you know, an hour or so of prep when you first get there, sort of just the basics, where to look, wh- how what kind of intonation you should look, uh, you should use. How do you put an earpiece in? You know, where do you, you know, how should you sit in your chair so it looks like you have good posture? What should you wear to the interview? I mean, there's there's a lot when you think about it that really goes into it because there's there's nothing worse than doing a TV interview and then watching yourself back and not liking the way you look or or how you're like perceived on air. So he'll go over that. And then based on the information that we give him, he actually does a mock interview, um, does it does several of them and he records it. And then you watch it back with him in studio, which can be painful for some of our clients if they don't like the way they sound or they have um, improvement to do. But literally all of them are so grateful for the experience because imagine if they had just walked into a studio cold and hadn't done any of that prep. It's just going to make you feel so much more comfortable because it can be nerve wracking to walk into a studio and all of a sudden there's, you know, 15 people in the studio, like there, camera guys, audio guys, lighting guys, there's hot lights, there's, you know, an anchor who does this every day, all made up and looking glamorous. And then you come in, like, you want to be feeling really good because that's going to contribute to you giving a good interview. Wow, definitely. (laughs) Sounds like going to that situation, you've done all this work, building up credibility, and you've hired a PR firm, spent all this money getting on the show, you definitely want to invest in and some media training seems. Yes, because if you, like I said, it's like if you if you don't and it doesn't go well, it it will, could be like worst thing, <laughs> you know. So you want to make sure you're going to be able to knock it out of the park. Yeah, it makes sense. So, what would your tips be on how to find and select a PR agency? So. It's a little bit tough from the outside. You know, the person, the publicist seems very personable and friendly and stuff, but how do you know in advance who's most likely to, to deliver and, and, you know, and, and, and deliver impact? I mean, I think 
Referrals are absolutely number one. If you can get a referral from a friend or a trusted business colleague or partner or something, that's always the best thing. So I would say my first piece of advice would be to sort of crowdsource people in your network for if they've worked with a PR firm and what their experience was with and if they would recommend that person. I think once you, and I mean, obviously there's just, you know, good old Google for, you know, searching and trying to find them on your own. I think once you speak with a, a publicist or sort of have that introductory call, the next critical thing is to speak to their clients. I have many clients, just had one this week, who's I think about to sign with us, but he wanted to speak to two of my clients, you know, as a referral prior to signing on the contract with us. And so, of course, we referred him to to two clients because there's nothing like hearing it straight from the horse's mouth, how the firm works and sort of where, you know, where their strengths lie and what their their results are. And then, you know, a, a lot of our clients, which I think is smart is to their benefit, add in uh, like a 30 day out clause in the contract. And we never um, put up a fight with that because, you know, we we haven't really we don't really get those types of problems usually it's it's working out and we have and we have happy customers but i think that's just a way to add in a little extra security if and when you do decide to hire a pr firm okay great well annie this has been hugely informative for me uh i did not know much about pr and i feel a bit more educated now um for someone who wanted to follow up with you what's the best place for them to find you online and reach out sure our website is pacepublicrelations.com and i am on twitter at, at annie scranton and i'm also on linkedin at annie scranton as well and hope to hear from from any of you who are listening fantastic and for anyone who wanted to reach out to Michael Sorrentino about media training, what's the best place to find Michael? He is online at sorrentinomedia.com. He shares a name with the Jersey Shore cast member, Mike, the situation Sorrentino. So he's kind of hard to find on Google if you just Google Sorrentino. So you would want to just go to sorrentinomedia.com and that's where he is. Fantastic. Annie, thank you so much for joining today. This was awesome. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Unleashed, the show that explores how to thrive as an independent professional. Unleashed is sponsored by Umbrex, the world's first global community of top-tier independent management consultants. The mission of Umbrex is to create opportunities for independent management consultants to meet, share lessons learned, and collaborate. I'd love to get your feedback and hear any questions that you'd like to see us answer on this show. You can email me at unleashed at umbrex.com. That's U-M-B-R-E-X dot com. If you found anything on the show helpful, it would be a real gift if you would let a friend know about the show and take a minute to leave a review on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. And if you subscribe, our show will get delivered to your device every Monday. Our audio engineer is Dave Nelson. Our theme song was composed by Gary Negbauer, and I'm your host, Will Bachman. Thanks for listening.